Welcome, I'm Dr. Stephen Vold, and I'm here today with Dr. Nathan Radcliffe and David Taylor from Reichert. And today we're going to be talking about the Reichert Ocular Response Analyzer. Thank you so much, guys, for coming. I'd like to start with you, David. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, you're the product manager for Reichert, is that correct? Correct. Well, tell me a little bit about corneal hysteresis. What do I need to know about this? Uh, corneal hysteresis is the world's only measurement of corneal biomechanical properties. Um, and uh, that is what makes the ocular response analyzer a unique product. It's the only device uh, that can make this in, in vivo measurement. So tell me, tell me some of the clinical applications. I understand that it started with some corneal applications in care to refractive surgery. Is that correct? That was the, the, the primary um, uh, applicability of it. Uh, the most obvious application of a biomechanical measurement of the cornea would be in, in refractive surgery. And how is this device helpful in that regard? Well, it's a, it's a tissue property measurement that gives you an indication of is this a strong cornea or is this a weak cornea? And obviously, you know, when you think about keratoconus um, and you think about performing refractive surgery on somebody, you don't want to do LASIK uh, or even PRK on somebody who has a biomechanically uh, weak cornea. And so um, our ability to screen for those types of uh, biomechanical weaknesses preoperatively gives the refractive surgeon an additional piece of information above and beyond topography and pachymetry to make that decision. So if someone were to ask you, what's the difference between a low hysteresis and a high hysteresis measurement, what does that mean to me as a glaucoma patient, what would you tell them? Well, um, a low hysteresis generally means it's a weak or soft cornea, and a high hysteresis generally means it's a tougher cornea. Uh, there's a lot of different variables that could come into play, but in general, that's, that's what you're looking at. Um, as a glaucoma patient, what we think that means, and Dr. Radcliffe can, can speak to this more, um, the cornea is representative of the overall tissue properties of the globe, we believe. And uh, so if you have a low hysteresis, that doesn't just mean you have an inherent structural weakness in your cornea that may carry through the entire eye, and there's where the glaucoma discussion comes into play. Excellent. Before I move on to Nate here, I'd just like to ask you, tell me a little bit about your ability to measure intraocular pressure with this device as well. Well, that's another interesting part of the puzzle. Uh, you know, everybody is aware now that corneal thickness plays a role in the uh, assessment of intraocular pressure. Um, the corneal biomechanical properties play an even bigger role because I often tell people a tonometer is just a force gauge. It's measuring the force required to flatten a curved surface, and the tonometer really doesn't care how thick that surface is. It cares how tough, how resistive that surface is. So our ability to quantify those um, biomechanical properties of the cornea enable us to make a pressure measurement that is less influenced by those properties. Well, that's very helpful. Thank you, David. Mm -hmm. Nate, let's talk a little bit about the literature and tell me about uh, what we know about corneal hysteresis and its apl applications and relevance in glaucoma. I see corneal hysteresis as the next evolution uh, in the corneal thickness story. We, you know, we first learned with corneal thickness that we may be uh, underestimating the pressure uh, in patients with thin corneas, but then we learned that corneal thickness is an independent risk factor for glaucoma progression. And we've seen the same thing, um, but perhaps a little bit stronger evidence now with corneal hysteresis. So for example, corneal hysteresis is associated with how much damage a given glaucoma patient will have. It's also associated with their risk for progressing. Uh, we've seen some other interesting things. Last year at the American Glaucoma Society, I uh, reported that patients with optic disc hemorrhage tend to have a lower corneal hysteresis. And to me, it's fascinating that a corneal property would correlate to uh, something we generally think of as an optic nerve sus uh, susceptibility. So we've seen a lot of interesting information that's caused us uh, to think about what hysteresis is telling us, maybe about the pressure, uh, maybe though about the eye's uh, tissue properties, its strength, and its susceptibility to glaucoma damage. Excellent. Now, I understand that there may be some differences in the type of glaucoma. How does that relate to uh, hysteresis measurements? For instance, in normal pressure glaucoma, are those patients going to be different than other types of glaucoma? Yeah, we have seen some evidence that, uh, for example, in normal pressure glaucoma, the hyster uh, hysteresis is much lower uh, than you might expect compared to normals or compared to patients with high pressure glaucoma. Um, but we've also seen things like uh, corneal hysteresis is correlated to the damage even in patients with angle closure glaucoma. So it's probably the case that low hysteresis masks uh, high pressure in some patients, uh, and those are the low tension glaucoma patients, but that across the glaucoma spectrum, 
if you have, um, if, you're, if the eye is experiencing stress, you're likely to have a uh, lower hysteresis in that eye. Excellent. Tell me a little bit about your research. I understand you're presenting here at the American Glaucoma Society meeting. I'd love to learn a little bit about that. Sure. So uh, we wanted to learn a little bit more about the interaction between corneal hysteresis and intraocular pressure. And uh, we did a study looking at 57 glaucoma patients on no therapy who were initiated on a topical prostaglandin analog, for example, uh, latanoprost. And we found some interesting things. Uh, first of all, once the patients were treated with the therapy, their hysteresis came up just a little bit. So there's some interplay. So whereas corneal thickness is a reasonably static measure of the eye, hysteresis is a little more dynamic. Um, although it didn't increase that much, just a little bit. But the most fascinating thing that we found was that corneal hysteresis is strongly associated with the magnitude of IOP lowering from a topical therapy. So, for example, if you had a low hysteresis of around 7 in this study, you tended to get a 30% IOP reduction from latanoprost, which is pretty good. Uh, however, if you had a high hysteresis of around 12, you got about 8% pressure lowering. So, this is, I see this as something where uh, the glaucoma or the treating physician could look at a patient, know their hysteresis, and guide their expectations for what they might expect for a therapy. Interesting. Has that ever been looked at at post-surgical patients, for instance, post-trabeculectomy? Uh, we have looked at this um, in all comers who have undergone uh, glaucoma surgery, and we've seen the same effect, and we'll be presenting this data at the uh, World Glaucoma Congress in Paris. Thank you so much. We've been here with David Taylor from Reichert and Dr. Nathan Radcliffe. I'm Stephen Vold, and thank you so much for watching.